Hi everybody and welcome to this session on physical activity. So the, the topic of this session is physical activity, the miracle pill. So we're going to be looking at uh, the benefits of physical activity um, and how that impacts on, a, on a, a healthy lifestyle. So before we get started, um, it might be useful if you just have access to a, a pen and paper um, so you can just uh, note a few things down as we go along through today's session. So the first thing I want you to just uh, consider is currently how confident do you feel you are to have a conversation with a client about physical activity? So one would be not confident at all, 10 would be very confident. So just have a few seconds and just jot down on some paper where you are on that scale. So what we're going to cover today, guys, so we're going to cover quite a bit today in today's session. Um, so um, firstly, we're going to look at um, the physical activity landscape in the UK and what that looks like, looking at some of the stats. Um, we're going to look at some of the benefits of being physically active. Uh, we're also going to look at the physical activity guidelines or recommendations that are set by the UK Chief Medical Officer. We're going to look at some of the common barriers that might prevent us and our clients from being physically active. We're also going to look at uh, some of the strategic um, partners and campaigns that, that are out there in the UK to try and promote and encourage physical activity. We're going to look at some of the, the local provision and signposting opportunities that, that might be available to us. And finally, we're going to look at some of the safety considerations with physical activity. So just a little bit about me, guys, before we get started. So my name's Nigel Stevenson. Um, I'm physical activity lead at One U Lincolnshire. So One U Lincolnshire is a, an integrated lifestyle service um, that has a dedicated Move More pathway. So as part of that, we work in partnership with local leisure centres. Um, we have one-to-one -one options. We have group delivery and also various kind of challenge and, and digital physical activity interventions as well. Um, so I've got um, over 20 years experience of working in the active leisure sector um, uh, and that, that's involved working in both the private, public and voluntary sectors of the leisure, leisure industry. Um, my role has vastly ranged um, initially more of a, a practitioner um, working on a one to one basis and also delivering group group sessions. Um, more recently, though, um, my role has been more kind of oversight, more of a co coordination management role, um, delivering a variety of health improvement programmes, including phase four cardiac rehab uh, sessions, um, exercise referral schemes. Um, so I am level four um, trained in a number of specialisms, including cardiac rehab, uh, diabetes, mental health and cancer rehab. Um, and crucially, still pretty passionate about the importance of physical activity, both um, on, a, on a personal level and also obviously in, in my, my work life as well. So what does physical activity mean to you? So again, just, just take a few seconds to reflect on that one. Um, physical activity will mean uh, lots of different things to, to, to each and every one of us. So just take a few seconds to jot down what it means to you. So we're just going to look at um, some useful definitions. So definition of physical activity um, from the World Health, Health Organization is any bodily movement that produces skeletal muscles that requires energy expenditure. So essentially any, anything where we're, we're activating our muscles is classed as physical activity. Um, and in terms of what exercise is, so exercise is a subset of physical activity that is planned, structured and repetitive. So for today's session, we're going to focus mainly on, on the, the generic, um, on generic physical activity as opposed to exercise. So how have ha our physical activity habits changed over a, over a period of time? So I've just pulled to, to, together a bit of a slide that hopefully just provides a little bit of context in terms of 
you know, how our habits have, have massively changed in, in recent times. So the first um, image on there, as you can see, is, is an image of hunter gatherers. So if we wind the clock back um, 10,000 years or so, um, we, we would have massively um, been much more active um, in terms of, you know, having to hunt our food down. Um, but not just that, you know, even when, when we probably managed to find our food, um, it probably would have taken a, a significant amount of energy expect, expenditure to actually prepare that food and, and cook that food as well. So fast forward um, several thousand years and um, the in introduction of the motor car. So in, in 1967, um, there were 10 million cars on our roads. Again, fast forward, you know, 50 years later um, and this year um, there were f uh, 41 million cars registered. So um, the, the ownership of, of cars has increased um, fourfold in the last 50 years or so. Again, more recently, um, so if we look at uh, 2007, um, the first iPhone was released. Um, and more recently in 2021, 88% of the UK population owned a smartphone. And if I look at my, uh, my children who are, who are 10 and, and 12, um, they are essentially the, the, I, the iPhone generation. They won't know anything different than you know, iPads, iPhones, laptops, the IT generation. Whereas I'm still old enough to remember actually the first uh, mobile phone, which was almost like a brick um, that got introduced. So how things have, have kind of really developed um, and how potentially that has, has impacted on our, our activity levels. And then the final one on here is um, in, in 2011, um, the um, deliver, food delivery companies really, really launched in the UK. Um, and you can see on there, Just Eat in 2022 processed more than 627 million orders, which is a phenomenal uh, number of deliveries that previously um, wouldn't, I guess, wouldn't have happened. So I guess these are just a few examples of, of how our physical activity levels and habits have changed over a period of time. Um, now, don't get me wrong, you know, the, the complexities around inactivity levels are much wider than these four things. But I think that that just gives a, a, a bit of an example. So let's have a look at um, the, the most up to date figures, physical activity figures in the UK. So you can see on, on here, this is taken from the Active Live survey, which is coordinated by Sport England. Um, this survey is, is done um, every year in the UK, both to, to adults and also to children. So this is the most recent data that we've got. Um, so the good news is um, adult physical activity levels in the UK have bounced back pretty much to where they were prior to, to uh, pandemic, um, COVID-19 outbreak. Um, obviously, they, they massively dropped off during that period, but they have bounced back to, to very similar to, to where they were at prior to that. So in terms of um, how many people are um, inactive, um, or sedentary. So one in four adults in the UK are doing less than 30 minutes of activity per week. So 20, 25.8% of a population. In terms of how many people are still not maintaining or managing to achieve 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week. So that is one in three adults. So nearly 38% of the, the adult population are not managing to uh, achieve that, that milestone. And also, um, there's a massive financial impact of um, inactivity levels. So in the UK, it's uh, expected that um, it costs the UK government £7.4 billion per year, which is a significant amount of money. And finally, um, one in six deaths in the UK is associated with um, being physically inactive. 
So what, what are the current guidelines? So when we're having conversations with our clients, what should we be recommending? So this is the, the current um, UK Chief Medical Officer guidelines um, for, for encouraging adults to be, to be more active. So first of all, um, the guidelines are that, that clients should aim to do 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. Um, that could also um, be vigorous um, intensity physical activity. Um, so as you can see on there, if you manage to do 75 minutes of vigorous intensity activity, that's the equivalent of doing, doing 150 minutes. So essentially, vigorous activity counts as double. However, we know that you know, the clients that we're supporting with long-term health conditions, I would question how many of our clients are, are gonna be doing much vigorous activity because it's probably not that suitable for some of those. Um, in terms of strengthening activities, um, we should be encouraging our clients to do two, uh, two days a week of some form of, of strength based activity. Now that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, taking out a, an expensive membership of, of the local gym. Um, that could be uh, things like carrying the, the shopping home and doing some body weight activity. Um, so it doesn't necessarily need to be gym based activity. Um, and also we want to be trying to encourage our, our clients to do two days a week where they're doing some type of balance improvement activity so again that could be bowling that could be dance that could be tai chi and um, the final one on that um, which a lot of people aren't aware of is we want to be trying to encourage our clients to to avoid sitting for long periods of time um, so what we we should be encouraging is every 20 minutes um, we, we try and get up and we just do some form of movement again to activate those muscles. Um, however, we know that, that that potentially is going to be quite challenging. Um, for example, this session is going to be half an hour. Um, so it might be if we can't if we can't get up and move around for every 20 minutes, it might be that we we can try and do it every every 60 minutes, which might be a bit more realistic. So in terms of um, the intensity of uh, physical activity, so we know that we want to try and encourage our clients to get up to that 150 minutes um, milestone. And we know that it, it should be of a moderate intensity. Um, but what does that mean? So uh, moderate intensity should be a, a level where our clients are slightly puffed out. Um, their heart rate is going to be elevated. Their breathing rate in turn will be, be increased. Um, so they do want to be slightly puffed out, but just about able to hold a com conversation whilst they're doing it. Um, one of the tools that we've got um, that is really useful, actually, is encouraging our clients to try to rate their own level of, of per uh, perceived exertion. So you can see on here we've got the, the RPE scale, which is on a scale from one to, to ten. So one would be doing no activity whatsoever. 10 would be working at our absolute maximum level. So ideally, a moderate intensity should be somewhere in between. So level four to six. Um, so encouraging um, our clients to, to utilize their own um, rate of perceived exertion is, is a really useful tool. Um, and another, another way of um, making sure that people are working hard enough is um, by doing the talk test. So if, if clients can comfortably hold a conversation whilst they're, they're exercising or, or taking part in physical activity, they're probably not quite working hard enough. So we, we've mentioned about the, the target of, of 150 minutes, which, which is um, the, the, the my, milestone we want to be getting our clients up to. But I think it's, it's also worth just, just mentioning that um, the impact of physical activity doesn't have to just be for those that are doing that 150 minutes. Um, we know that lots of the clients that we're supporting will have long-term health conditions. We know that they might have been uh, physically inactive for a long period of time. So actually getting them up to that 150 minute mark might not be that realistic. It might not be that achievable. It might for some take, take a little bit longer. Um, 
So I think it's really important that that actually we we celebrate the the benefits and we celebrate the the achievements of those that go from doing absolutely no activity up to doing some some activity. And the really good thing about that is proportionately those guys that even manage to get up to 30 or 40 minutes proportionately stand to, to gain the biggest from that that movement. So the first 30 minutes of physical activity is the most important, um, as you can see on here. So, so yes, we want to try and support our clients to get up to 150 minutes, but we should also bear that in mind. So those that, that do uh, go from doing nothing at all up to something stands proportionately to make, make the biggest ba uh, benefits. So um, with your pen and paper, guys, um, we're just going to look at uh, some of the some of the uh, the real benefits, some of the, the stats um, looking at long term health conditions. So for those guys that can get up to 150 minutes, there's a massive um, risk reduction in terms of lots of long term health conditions. So the first one on here being type two diabetes or lifestyle diabetes. So if we can get our clients up to the chief medical officer's guidelines of 150 minutes, two, two times um, strength exercises per, per week, how much can we reduce the risk of our clients from getting type two diabetes? So the answer to that is 50%, which is a, a massive uh, risk reduction. So potentially one in two people wouldn't get type 2 diabetes uh, if we could support them to be more physically active. So what about high blood pressure or hypertension? So how how much can physical activity reduce the risk uh, of someone uh, suffering from, from high blood pressure? So the answer again is by up to 50%. So again, in one in two people potentially could avoid suffering from high blood pressure if we can support them to be physically active. So current, currently heart disease. So how much could we reduce the risk of someone from suffering from that condition? So the answer to that one is 40%. Um, so four out of 10 people potentially could avoid um, getting coronary heart disease. So cardiovascular disease. So what's the risk reduction if clients are physically active? So it's a 35% reduction. So three and a half out of 10 people potentially wouldn't suffer from cardiovascular disease. So stroke is the next long-term health condition. So how much can that be reduced? So the answer to that is 30% reduction. So one in three people potentially could avoid suffering from a stroke. Again, if we can support them to be physically active. So cancers, uh, so specifically breast and colon cancers, how much can we reduce that risk? So there's a 25% reduction. Uh, so one in four people potentially uh, wouldn't suffer from some of the more, more common cancers like breast and colon cancers. So joint and back pain. So how much can that be reduced by being physically active? So there's a 25% risk reduction of suffering from joint and back pain. So one in four people potentially wouldn't suffer from that if we managed to get them physically active. So next long-term health condition is dementia. So 
So how much can we, can we reduce that by? So there's a 21% risk reduction. So one in, one in five people potentially wouldn't suffer from dementia. So falls, so we know as, as people get older, the risk of falling uh, massively increases. So by how much can we reduce that risk of someone falling? So there's a 21% risk reduction. Again, if we can support our clients to be active. So one in five people potentially wouldn't, wouldn't suffer from a fall. And obesity, so by definition, anyone with a body mass index of above 30. So how much can we reduce the risk of someone suffering from obesity? So there's a 10% risk reduction if we can support our clients to be active. So potentially one in 10 people wouldn't suffer from um, obesity. We know obviously there's lots of other factors that, that impact on, on obesity levels as well. So all cause, cause mortality, which is a bit of a, a scary phrase actually. Um, so what that means is we know that there's uh, more than 25 long-term health conditions where we can reduce um, our our risk of, of getting that condition by being physically physically active. Um, so essentially what this does is it takes an average across all of those conditions. So if we could support our clients from getting them those long term health conditions, hopefully we're gonna we're gonna reduce the risk of of catching those and essentially you know an, an early death. So what is the the average figure across 25 long-term health conditions. So our risk reduction uh, from all cause of mortality is 30%. Um, so potentially one in three people um, wouldn't, wouldn't suffer from a range of long-term health conditions um, and is likely to live longer, which is amazing. Okay, so um, you might be wondering where those stats have come from. Um, <clears throat> so the, the evidence base for, for that information that we've just looked at um, is from Moving Medicine. So if you haven't come across Moving Medicine, I'd, I'd certainly encourage you have a look on, on their website. Um, so really um, well evidenced. Um, there's loads of scientific papers that, that back, up, back up all of these, these numbers. Um, I know in Lincolnshire, we, we use a lot of their uh, data to really promote the benefits of physical activity um, and, and encourage you know, more healthcare professionals to, to signpost into our services. Um, so yeah, that, that shows um, the information that we've just looked at there. So yeah, one of the key ones is the, the reduction of type 2 diabetes, which is very, very relevant, particularly for Thrive Tribe and all the, the DPP programmes that we're, we're currently launching. Okay, so we, we've just looked at um, some of the some of the stats around various long term health conditions. Um, so what I want to do now is just um, really show showcase some of the, the practical or functional benefits that, that our clients are, are potentially going to see. So introducing um, one of our clients from Lincolnshire. So this is this is Terry. Terry actually was was the first client that we supported on our Move More um, program way back in 2019. Um, so you can see the image on on here. This was taken in the last week of of his program actually. So after 12 weeks. Um, now one of the, the biggest um, one of, one of, one of Terry's main goals actually when he first came to see us was he just wanted to be able to put his, his socks on a bit more independently. I think over a period of time, he just got um, his body had, had just got deconditioned from from not being active, not really knowing what what he could or, or should be doing. 
not not having any idea around any recommendations. So again, hopefully what we did is it just offered him a, a little bit of support, um, hopefully um, building up his confidence. And, and I'm pleased to say at the end of the program, um, we managed to, to get him to, to put his socks on a lot more independently. So his main goal was achieved. So as you can see on here, we, we managed to get him a, a pair of One U Lincolnshire branded socks, which he was, he was thoroughly uh, chuffed about. Um, but also from an integrated point of view, now Terry was only on our Move More pathway, um, but you can see on here um, how much he managed to achieve. So we managed to get him going from zero um, minutes of activity up to hitting 150 minutes. Um, probably his biggest challenge actually was um, getting him to reduce on his alcohol. Um, again, he just got into bad habits of, of drinking maybe half a bottle of wine a day. Again, with no idea of, of how much he, he, he should be drinking. So we managed to, to support him with that, offering him very brief advice. Um, we managed to get him eating more healthily. So we managed to get him up to, to eating five or more portions of fruit and veg a day. And, and as a result of all of those changes, over the 12 weeks, we managed to get him to lose 4.7% uh, of his body weight. So we just missed out on a, a clean sweep of hitting our 5% weight loss target. But I'm sure probably within a, a week or two, he, he probably would have hit that. Um, so yeah, that's just one example of, of how you know, supporting our clients to be more physically active um, can have, have a huge impact on um, a variety of, of different lifestyle elements. Okay, so the second case study I just wanted to share is um, from a, a more recent client actually from Lincolnshire. So introducing you to Anne, um, so I'm just going to share with you the, the quote on here. So I am now able to move much better and I can bend easier to do the gardening, which I love. I never thought exercise would help my well-being and mental health, but I always come out of a session feeling on top of the world. I feel happier in myself. My get up and go was gone, but now it's back. Uh, now, Anne was um, one of our group um, clients. So she took part in one of our community physical activity groups. Um, in one of the, the more rural parts of the county. Um, and I think this really just demonstrates um, the importance of the, the kind of social connected um, or connection side of, of being physically active. Um, I think for Anne, um, it was just so incredibly important for her to get out and about, meet people, um, make new friends, um, and really just helping her, uh, you know, prevent her from, from being lonely. Um, and I think so often we, we forget about those more kind of softer sides of, of, of physical activity and, you know, being part of a group that, that is so important. So um, when we did this session live, we, we did a, a, a group discussion task. Uh, now, obviously, um, with this being a recorded session, um, we, we won't be, be doing um, having group interaction. Um, but what I want you to do is just take a few minutes, and again, with your, your pen and paper, just jot, jot down these three questions. Um, so the first one I want you to consider is the common barriers that might prevent yourself from being physically active. Um, but also think about the clients that you might be supporting as well. Now, those barriers actually might be the same. Um, but yeah, think about what, what barriers prevent us from being physically active. Question two, um, I want you to have a think uh, about what top tips you might be able to prove, uh, provide to our clients um, that might help overcome um, with some of those identified barriers. And question three, I want you to, to think about where you might be able to signpost a client to uh, for them to get appropriate physical activity support. I know in Lincoln, we, we deliver a lot of our interventions, but I know on the DPP course, it, it probably is more about the education and signposting. So I want you to think about where, where you, you might be able to send uh, or direct our clients to.
So the, the common barriers there, now I've broken these down into, into five um, different sections. So hopefully you might, you might have um, jotted down a, a few of these. So first of all, physical barriers. Um, so the types of things that that might include is, is kind of lack of fitness, um, which can be a really common one. Uh, we know that you know injury or long-term health conditions or, or illnesses um, might be be a, a reason for for lack of activity. It might be that our clients are recovering from surgery um, and as a result of that have, have felt uh, pain. Um, it might be more to do with um, what they've got in their local area, so uh, proximity to facilities. Um, but it, it could also be that they might. Uh, have limited transport. So we know that financial barriers can, you know, particularly at the minute in in times of, of cost of living, uh, a cost of living crisis, that 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 can be a barrier. So we know that uh, limited finances uh, that might be due to uh, unemployment. Um, it might be that we we need to prioritise for our our family and and can't afford to invest in in memberships or, or, or clubs. Um, and we know, you know, for sure that, that some of these clubs can be quite, quite expensive. So it could be, the barriers could be more um, of an emotional nature. Um, so we know that depression or anxiety um, could, could be a barrier. Uh, we know that, you know, lack of confidence, you know, not knowing what people could do um, and we know that that could, um, that could man manifest in embarrassment um, or fearfulness um, to actually give something, give something a go for the first time. So it could be motivational barriers. I think we've, we've probably all um, felt ourselves at some point, you know, that we've perhaps got bored of, of something that we've been doing. Um, certainly, if I reflect back to my school days, you know, negative past experiences, you know, those those days where we've been told that we've got to go out and do a, a cross country run in the middle of winter, you know, where our PE teachers probably all nicely wrapped up and we're, we're in a, a tiny, tiny pair of shorts. You know, certainly from my experience, I, I still still remember that from from 30 years or so ago. Um, we know that dislikes, um, you know, dislike of exercise or, or the word exercise can be a big barrier for some people um, and you know potentially it could be um, that, that people have got excess stress in their life which, which could also be a barrier and the final one is, is time barriers you know how many how many times do people say oh, I just haven't got time to do it and that could be that could be related to work commitments family commitments it could be related to us going on holiday um, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully some of these um, are some of the barriers that you you considered as well. Okay, so what advice or top tips can we give to our clients to try and support them to be more physically active? So Sport England have, have published eight top tips, which which you can see on the screen here. So the top left hand corner is a really important one. So ideally, we want to try and support our clients to find something that they enjoy doing. I think probably we can all recognise if if it's something we don't enjoy, um, the chances of us sticking to it long term is, is going to be massively reduced. Um, I think also we need to try and encourage our clients to set goals and make a plan. So no different to in our working life, um, we would always try and schedule something into our diary simply because if it's not in there, it's, there's, a, there's a much greater chance of us, us forgetting about it. I think also making some small changes. I think sometimes we're, we're our own worst enemy in terms of you know, setting really ambitious, ambitious targets, particularly in, in the new year period, uh, where actually it comes back to trip us up because if we don't manage to, to achieve those targets, again do we do we drop off it totally um, and i think building new habits into our into our daily routine um, so again that could be you know trying to build in a an active lunch break or or tea break um, it could be you know every time that you you get up from your desk you know encouraging our clients to do 10 squats for example 
Um, it might be that we try and get our clients to do stuff outdoors. Um, we know that there's, there's massive um, evidence that shows that you know exposure to natural sunlight, vitamin D, and also being close to nature. So again, encouraging people to use natural environments that, that might be readily available to us. I think starting slowly and, and, and building up gradually is, is an important message. Um, and listening, encouraging our clients to listen to their own body. Ultimately, they will know better than anyone how they're feeling um, and to take it at their own pace. And the final one on here is, is encouraging our clients to buddy up. So we know that you know if they do it as a as a family or if they do it with friends, it just adds some extra accountability into it. Um, whereas if if individually you don't feel up to it, again, if you've got an appointment with your friends, um, it might be that they're they're going to be a, a a good motivator. Okay, guys, so the next slide is just looking at uh, some of the, the national physical activity campaigns and resources that are out there. Some of these you might be aware of, some of them maybe not quite so much. So top left hand corner on here um, is the, the Royal College of GP Active Practice Kite Mark or, or campaign. Um, so this launched a, a few years ago now. And what it is, is essentially a, a, a commitment from GP surgeries um, around encouraging both their patients and their staff to be more physically active um, so that they have to demonstrate that they've ticked various boxes to be able to, to be awarded this kite mark. Um, so again, it might be worth you guys just having a, a, a little look um, at your local GP surgeries to see how many of those practices have actually signed up to that because it might be a, a good way to actually reach out to them to try and encourage them to to refer into your services on a local level. Um, the active partnership, so bottom left hand corner there, you hopefully might be aware of these already. Um, essentially, active partnerships are funded by Sport England. Um, so the Sport England uh, 10 year strategy was launched a few years ago now. Um, and essentially on a local level, the active partnerships are responsible for, for delivering that 10 year strategy. A key part of that strategy is looking to engage with the health uh, and social care sector um, to try and support them to be more, more physically active. So what I'd strongly suggest is if you haven't um, researched or you haven't reached out to your local active partnership, I would strongly encourage that you do that because some of the services that you're delivering, I'm sure they would be really keen to to kind of be aware of and potentially uh, promote and, and signpost, signpost into. I know in Lincolnshire, we've got Active Lincolnshire and we work really closely with them. Top right hand corner on here. Um, so we are undefeatable campaign. Um, so that's um, that's a better health campaign. Um, and as you can see on here, really relatable images there. Essentially, a key part of that campaign is is um, making sure that the, the imagery are relating to people with long term health conditions. As you can see, that the guy on there, you know, clearly had a had a heart bypass uh, surgery at some point, um, and again encouraging, you know, that demographic, uh, people with long-term health conditions, to really consider taking part in activity. And the bottom right-hand corner there, again, some of the stats that we've looked at today have come from Moving Medicine. Um, so again, if you haven't had a look, have a look on their website. Loads of really useful information on there. That tends to be more for practitioners or healthcare professionals as opposed to, to clients. Um, but again, just some really useful places to, to signpost and get some, some resources from. So signposting opportunities then. Um, so just, just flagged a few of the, the main options on here. So first of all, park run. Hopefully some of you guys may be aware of that. Hopefully may have taken part in that. Personally, I think that's that's such a good um, program. It's been going now for probably about 10 years. Uh, so essentially what it is, is a, a five kilometer organized walk or run. So don't be put off by the name Park Run. Um, it's totally free of charge. All you need to do is, is log onto their website, print off your own barcodes, 
you'll then be able to find out where your local park run is. Lincoln, for example, has got three park runs. Um, they all take place at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. Um, a big part of that is about encouraging people to, to take part. Uh, there's lots of volunteers that line the route, uh, encouraging people along. So again, it might be that people could walk it. It might be that um, if it's a lap circuit, that if people aren't able to do five kilometers, it might be initially they, they aim to do one lap. Um, but yeah, just a really, really good program, which is uh, on a national level, um, but just a really good good way to try and connect people with, with activity. Um, there's lots of uh, apps out there, uh, but the two that I've, I've marked on here is the Active 10 app and the Couch to 5K. So the Active 10 app essentially um, works on GPS tracking. Again, they're both free of charge to download, but essentially every every time that um, the app detects that you've been, um, been moving for 10 minutes, it will give you a little recognition. Um, so every time you, you move for more than 30 minutes, you'll get three recognitions, which over the course of a week, you, you would hit your, your 150 minute milestone. Um, obviously the catch to 5K, you know, is one that is, is widely known. Uh, you can decide who, who you want to do it with, who you want to, to be your kind of buddy um, out of the, the, the people that have recorded messages on there. The, the Walking for Health programme, which is, a, again, a, a programme that's been offered all, all over the country. Again, um, organised health walks, totally free of charge. So we remove any financial barriers. Um, so again, um, it might be worth just seeking out what's available in your local area, you know, where those walks uh, take place. Um, Good Boost. Um, so that's a water based program which has been rolled out, obviously um, being delivered by local leisure centres. Um, that tends to really target those with mus musculoskeletal conditions. So those that might really struggle to, to do any higher impact activities. So the, the low impact water based um, exercise is really good for that. So, again, might be worth you know, doing a bit of research to see if that's available in your local area. And um, as you can see, bottom right hand corner there, the Let's Move link into your activity finder. So it might be that most of your active partnerships have invested in in some kind of an activity finder, which essentially is a database where you can put in your postcode. Um, and then it should bring up all available options or local sports clubs, um, organised activities um, in your area that, that they can give a go. Um, and finally on here, the Gloji Gym one. So that, if you're not already aware, that's Thrive Drive's physical activity platform, which was created during lockdown. So again, um, it's a digital resource, totally free of charge um, for our clients to take part in, um, a, w a real range of of different um, activity sessions on there from really low, low impact, low intensity through to stuff that's um, a lot more higher intensity. And um, so this is Glazy Gym on here. Um, so I've just shared this video. So it just uh, shows you some of the, the imagery that we've got on there. So clients will just need to log in to Gloji Gym, so Google Gloji Gym, and then they'll just need to register, which takes just a couple of minutes. They'll need to, to mark which service that they're attached to, um, and then that's a, that's a free re resource that they can access um, in their own time. OK, so we're nearly finished, guys. So last last few slides. So just wanted to, to cover um, a slide on uh, any any kind of risks that might be associated with promoting physical activity. I know historically, certainly people have always viewed uh, physical activity as, as having a, an element of risk, which I think um, is the case with anything that, that we do in, in life. Um, unfortunately, we can't eliminate, um, you know, a, a little bit of risk. Um, but I think just to reassure you guys when you're having these conversations, um, 
there's recently been um, a consensus statement around physical activity. Um, so two of these bits on here make up part of that. So step one and step five, which I think are, are, are crucial elements of that statement. And I think the first one is uh, the benefits far, far outweigh the risks uh, or any potential risks. So physical activity is safe even for people with long term li living with with symptoms from, from multiple medical conditions. So I think that's that's really, really important for, for you guys to be aware of. Um, and the, the bottom uh, bit on here. So I guess when we're when we're having conversations and trying to encourage our clients to to get started, I guess it's always just uh, worth being um, aware that people that are, are starting to move uh, for the first time, you know, they might feel a little bit of tenderness. They might feel a little bit of soreness. They might get DOMS, so delayed onset of, of muscle soreness. Um, so essentially what that is, is it's the, the micro tearing of, of our muscles. Um, so generally you will get DOMS um, when you're doing things, anything that you're doing for the first time or, or, you know, things that you haven't done for a very long time, which is a little bit of a, a little bit of a shock to the body. Um, and generally speaking, it, it will just be a little bit of tenderness, but generally tends to last for a, for a couple of days, usually up to 48 hours. Um, but obviously, as, as our body starts to get conditioned and we start to do those activities on a more regular basis, um, those kind of pains and, and, and tenderness should should not not be a pr as prevalent at all. But again, it's just worth you know reassuring our clients if, if they do happen to, to feel a little bit tender and a little bit sore, particularly in the first couple of days. And, and the final bit on here um, is, is is really a key message um, around, you know, if, if any of our clients uh, are mentioning that they've got um, kind of unstable or, or uncontrolled uh, medical conditions, we, we really important that we um, direct them back to their, their GP, uh, direct them back to their, their medical uh, professional. Um, and the types of things we're looking for here is, is anything where um, they're getting uh, chest, heart related chest pains, uh, perhaps dizziness, um, or, or any kind of sudden change to, to any of their, their health conditions. Um, Really important that we, we encourage them to get that investigated with their healthcare professional. Uh, we know hopefully once that's sorted, um, physical activity is, is so beneficial both from a physical point of view and from a, a mental health point of view. But again, just really important that if anyone does appear to be kind of in an unstable condition, uh, new new conditions, again, encourage them to get that checked out first with their, with their GP. OK, and, and we're nearly finished now then, guys. So um, like we did at the beginning, what I want you to do is just rate how confident you feel you are now about having conversations around physical activity. So one would be not confident. Ten would be very confident. Um, hopefully, you know what you rated it at, at the beginning of this session, 40 minutes or so ago. Um, will be be much in, increased now at the end of the session. And finally, um, what I'd like you to do um, off the back of this session, there is a little quiz that we've created. Um, so the link to the, to the form is on here. Um, so if you can just put that into, into your search bar, um, that should um, bring up the, uh, the link to a, to a Microsoft form. And there is only 10 questions on there. Most of them are multiple choice. All of those questions are, are things that we've covered in, in this training session today. Um, so it should only take probably five or 10 minutes to complete. So if you could go um, click on that link or, or type that link in um, and fill that in, that, that would be great. And finally, just wanted to say a big thanks for, for listening in um, and taking part in this training session. Um, and yeah, good luck with, with all the delivery that, that you're going to be doing on, on whatever program that you're launching. Um, thank you very much. Cheers.